Hi, my name is Avery, and I'm going to share with you a project that I'm working on. Um, I'm really excited about. Uh, so I'll turn off the lights now and get rolling. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about BlueGene, which is a project I'm running at Boss Lab to synthesize indigo with bacteria. So that's what that's what Project BlueGene is. We'll let's do the laser. Um, so it's a project to develop a plasmid with a gene in it that will allow bacteria to produce indigo on rich media. So that's generally we grow them in, just sort of LB broth, uh, LB auger, basically the most common bacteria food. Um, and you'll put them on there and they'll turn blue. They'll actually be producing indigo and other related pigments. Um, so I'm going to give you a short history of indigo, kind of some cool, interesting indigo things. Uh, it's originally from this plant, indigo ferrotinctura. Um, this is sort of, a, there are a lot of plants that produce indigo, but this is sort of the canonical one, I guess. Um, and it's actually, we'll see the sort of reaction that it uses, or that people use to get the indigo out of this plant. Because as you can see, it's not very blue. It's mostly pink and green, um, like most plants. Uh, but it actually produced this really intense blue dye with it, which is, you know, it's, it's the color of jeans. It's a pretty cool color. Um, a related pigment, and possibly a mixture of indigo and indorubin, which is sort of a related compounds to indigo that this plasma will also probably be able to create is um, Tyrian purple. And so this is Hercules and his dog, and they're discovering Tyrian purple on the shore of Tyre. Um, and this area was actually a sort of hub for, for pigment production, um, you know, for the, for the Romans and the, the Greeks. And so all the dark purple robes, all the really rich people had this, the way they got it is they sent a whole bunch of people out to the sea um, and they'd gather up a bunch of snails, like this one. So this dog has a snail and this is discovered purple. And it's this purple pigment that comes from this, from this snail, which is weird. Um, and it's a very similar reaction to the one that, to get indigo from a plant, um, except it's this really rich purple. So they use this as a dye and send their, their you know, workers or slaves, whatever they had in the day. Um, out there, they'd say, get all the snails you can get. They'd bring them back. They'd smash them up and boil them. It would smell really awful. Um, they'd reduce this. They'd simmer it down so they have this really dark, dark pigment. Um, they'd dip their, their cloth in it and, uh, and make these ropes from really incredibly rich people. So it took thousands of these snails. Um, then Constantinople fell. And then people had switched to other dyes because they no longer had tons and tons of people to send out hunting for these slaves, uh, for, the, for the snails. Um, and then this guy, um, you know, he's, he's hanging out with some of his chemistry buddies and figured this out. Uh, so this guy, who organizes this guy, uh, Bayer, who, you know, Bayer Aspirin, uh, the Bayer Chemical Company, um, actually started as a dye company. And he actually won a Nobel chemistry prize for this synthesis. Um, and he started with, you know, some kind of horrible uh, sort of benzene chemical and um, this other chemical, uh, which is, if I click this, uh, yeah, two nitro benzyl aldehyde and acetone. Some full disclosure, I'm not a chemist. Um, and synthesized indigo from it. So this is indigo. Uh, this is how people did it. People now use aniline, uh, I think, as a sort of starting chemical. Um, but this is how plants do it, or how people extract it from plants. So actually what happens is in the plant you have satin and indican, and those are broken down by some enzymes into endoxyl, which are these chemicals here. And that, when you smash up the plant, oxidizes with the air to create indigo, which is the pigment that everyone knows and loves uh, and wears. Um, so this, this is the, the sea snail, and what it has is pretty much endoxyl, and it's got these little bromine uh, elements stuck on there on the ends. Um, and so when you smash up the slug again, or the, the, sorry, the snail, you oxidize it, 
They stick together, and you got this really dark pigment. It's really nice purple. Um, so here are some you know related compounds. Um, this is indigo up in the upper left. Uh, this is interrubin, and so you can see it's indigo, only that left uh, endoxyl sort of rotated one, uh, one bond. You know? um, this is loose indigo, so to dye things, you actually have to turn indigo into loose indigo um, by adding these oxygens here. Um, and what that does is it allows it to be soluble, um, sort of get into things, and then when you pull it out of the, out of the dye, again, it oxidizes with the air and turns back into indigo. Um, yeah. And so this is how bacteria do it. And so hopefully you can see the little laser. But you start out with tryptophan, which is over there in the upper left. Tryptophanase, which this is already present in E. coli, turns it into indole. And so indole is actually the bad smell from E. coli. Um, it's actually described as like the fecal matter smell in, in a a big book of chemicals. Um, and so a couple pathways, neither of which I'll be using, but which do similar things, um, are naphthalene dioxygenase and xylene oxidase. And both of those basically, the sum of, of their use is that they turn indole into endoxyl. Endoxyl, it gets exposed to the air, it's turned into indigo, or uh, into rubin in some cases. And so it's actually interesting you can make all these different pigments because they're all very closely related in structure. Um, and so there are a couple of indigo generating genes. All of these actually code for enzymes that do uh, that that do this that go from indole to endoxyl. That's really the key step. Um, and so there's a Rhodococcus pigment gene, so called. Really, it's a it's an enzyme. Um, and that that's the one that I want to use. It's one point one kilobase is 1,163 bases. Um, so it's sort of the smallest one I've been able to find. There is this uh, Bergholderia gene. Uh, it's a toluene uh, oxidase. And that's five kilobases. That's actually a whole set of genes. It's a whole operon. It's quite large, so we won't be using that one. Um, there's one from Pseudomonas that is uh, from a naphthalene. Uh, Degrader, and that's 1.3 kilobases, which is again, you know, 200 bases bigger than this than this first one. Um, this first one was actually discovered in uh, 1989 by a couple of guys in South Africa. What they did is they just took a, they took the whole genome of Rhodococcus, uh, you know, cut out the restriction enzymes, put it in a bunch of plasmids, and just sort of like looked at it and, until they saw something interesting. They saw one that was blue, so they picked that colony and they wrote a whole bunch of papers about it. Um, they'll come into play again later. And so you can do a lot of interesting things with this indigo gene. One thing you can do is you can take the gene and clone it into a plasmid, just like, uh, you know, Puck 18. Uh, but instead of black Z, you'd have, you know, a uh, blue gene in here. And so when you clone something into the blue gene and disrupt the gene's function, then it will no longer produce indigo. Um, just like when you clone something into black Z, in PUC-18, it no longer produces, uh, you know, lactase and can't break down X-gal. So the point of this, for those of you who don't know, is um, you, you take a gene that you want to put into a plasma, and you, you cut up the gene, like we saw a laxity over there, and put your gene in there. And if, it, if it's in there, then laxity doesn't work anymore. They can't degrade the, the X-gal that you put them on, and they'll be white. If they can degrade it, then they'll be like these guys, and they'll be blue. Um, the upshot of this is you no longer need to have the substrates. You don't need x -gal. You can You can plate them on anything. Um, the dye is really hardy. It's not soluble in liquids, or no, sorry, in lipids or water. So you don't have to worry about dissolving or diffusing very much. Um, and so it'd be a really good indicator uh, for sort of blue-white screening. Um, so that's one thing that I hope to do. It was actually done, but the plasma was lost. That plasma was made in 1990. And, uh, there, you know, ad gene doesn't have it. The, the sequence may be available, excuse me, but you can't actually get the, the, the article. So it's kind of useless.
Um, the other thing you can do is make a whole bunch of different colors with it. So the two that we'll probably start out with getting are probably indigo, primarily indigo, and indorubin. And so indorubin is actually found to be created by this gene already. So we don't need to modify it at all. But these are from the toluene uh, oxidase gene. And, you know, you can see you get all kinds of colors. You get, you know, blue, purple, uh, purpley colors, indorubin, which is a pinkish red, uh, yellow, brown, green, all sorts of other shades of brown. Um, so you can make some really cool colors with this, uh, with, with maybe mutations or changing the, the pH or maybe the amount of uh, different chemicals present when, this, when the sort of reactions happen. Um, and you can even probably take out the enzyme, extract the enzyme, and then use it on other chemicals to try and you know, create maybe Tyrian purple with the, with the bromides. Um, so that would certainly be interesting to try. So the plan is to get this vector, which is called P2KV. Uh, it's from Open Biotech. It's Creative Commons Attribution License, so I can use it, I can sell it, I can give it to someone for free. They don't have to worry about any patents or anything, really, um, as long as they say, you know, it's P2KV, which was originally from Open Biotech. Uh, and so we can actually take this and make it way more useful by adding a, you know, blue-white screening in the MCS. Um, and so actually, one of the outcomes of this is hopefully to have a blue-white screening vector with ampicillin resistance that I can then send back to Open Biotech, and they'll distribute it to people, to anyone who wants it, basically. Um, so you'll actually be able to get this plasmid. So we'll start with the sequence. This is from a Rhodococcus that's in the ATCC collection. But we're not going to buy it because to buy the organism from the ATCC, it costs $350. On top of that, you have to then grow the organism, copy out the gene you want with PCR, um, have that sequenced, and then clone that into your vector. And that's sort of where you can begin the fun stuff. Um, it turns out that this, they did some more, you know, a heart did, and so he's the guy who discovered the, uh, the gene, did more tests, and he found out that this is sort of the important stuff. This is just some extra stuff he got from the genome. This is some extra stuff he got from the genome. Um, but this is the actual part of the enzyme that acts on the endoxyl. So this is all we need, and this is only 1.1 kilobases. Um, and that turned out to be really cheap to synthesize. You can do it through GeneArt strings and get two strings of you know, 600 base pairs for $100 per string, so $200 to synthesize it, which is way less than it would cost to buy the organism. Or you can have it synthesized uh, by GenScript with this lovely, you know, they've got DNA synthesis on sale, which I think is kind of crazy. We definitely live in the future. Um, but this synthesis will cost $325, which is less than buying the organism and much less than buying the organism and doing a bunch of stuff to get the gene out of it. Um, so we'll probably go with these guys and just have them synthesize it, get a little tube, and then we'll just we'll clone it into our plasmid. So we'll grab our plasmid vector, we'll have chosen some Y's restriction enzyme sites on the, to add to the end of, our, uh, of the gene. We'll cut it, ligate it, transform it, um, take the transformants, hopefully they should be blue. If they're not, then I'll be concerned. Um, but take those, extract the DNA out of them, uh, you know, do sort of, uh, just check to see if the gene fragment that we've inserted is the right lane, send this out to be sequenced, which we can do locally, we'll have the results back in a day. Um, and then, you know, we'll found the gene, we'll know where the restriction enzyme sites are, if there are any, you know, slight mutations from the synthesis. And, We'll have a plasma vector that we can then activate um, by cloning into. We'll have something we can generate indigo with. We'll be able to mutate it, should we so desire, to try and produce other colors. And this will be available to, you know, the DIY biologist, any biologist really, who wants to uh, grab this plasma. Um, so hopefully we'll see something like this. These are some scanning electron images. 
uh, microscope images of the E. coli cells. We don't have one of those. Um, but you can see it's kind of on the outsides, which is really cool. And then here's a slide of, uh, this is the toluene monooxygenase. Those making the different colors. Uh, this is sort of blue, got some red, some brown, some bluish. And hopefully we'll see something like this. It'll be really cool. You can extract out the indigo. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, so thanks for listening. If you have any feedback, comments, concerns, things I should think about, because I'm not, you know, I don't have a, a doctor in biology or anything, um, or chemistry for that matter. So if you see anything that you think I should be concerned about or aware of, um, feel free to drop me a line. I'm on the DOI Bio Boston list. I'm on the DOI Bio Google group, a little sort of global list. Um, and you can also reach me through bosslab.org. Uh, so thanks, thanks for listening.